This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Welcome to the On Labs podcast. Our special guest today. Oh my God, nobody's going to believe that I have in front of me right now, Rich Burroughs. Oh, yeah, Rich. Hey, dude, thank you so much for coming. Bill, you are gassing me up really hard here. I need to like keep you around. I need to like talk to you daily so you can like help with my self esteem. Oh, dude, uh, uh, from where I'm sitting, I love everything that I see coming out of Twitter. You're like well, one of you. my favorite people to follow because you got a lot of unique content. You got kind of unique thoughts and ideas. And I trim my my Twitter fo- tw- Twitter. Listen to me, Twitter followers probably every six months. I and not because. If if I stop following you, don't take it personally. It's it's not that. I just can't handle a large amount of noise in my feed. And I've started to learn that if I follow certain people, I'll get other people for free. I I yeah, I mean Twitter started really aggressively pushing stuff into your feed a few years ago from people that you don't follow and there are people that I I literally have done that with where like I don't follow them because I know I'm going to see all of their best tweets anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of times when a tweet comes in my timeline that I really like, I'll look to see who retweeted it, right? Um, and it, and I don't know. I just I need to keep keep the the numbers down. But you're definitely somebody that I don't think I will get rid of for for a long time. So I'll see if I can alienate you. But no, it's it's uh, it's funny when you mention the retweeting because like that's something that I really do like think about. You know, like I feel like that's an important part of Twitter is you know sharing things with other people, and like I try to be thoughtful about what I retweet. But at the same time, you need to tweet things that are about that you're interested in that that maybe isn't necessarily popular. Like I've tweeted stuff and. I've noticed like 10 people fall off within like an hour and I kind of laugh at it, but, but I rather be real and you know that than me trying to be fake just to maybe keep you around. I don't know. I don't know how that works, but. Yeah. I think that honestly, I think that part of the reason why I've had what success I have had on Twitter and I don't consider myself by any means a big Twitter personality or anything like that, but you know, I've got like 12,000 followers now and you know, so obviously some people are interested in what I have to say. And I think that um, a lot of that is because of the fact that I try to be pretty real and and vulnerable. And I talk about mental health issues and things that, you know, not everybody's willing to come out and say, hey, I have anxiety or depression or ADHD, whatever. And I totally understand that. Like, I think for a lot of people, that's not going to be the right thing for them to share, you know, but um but I'm pretty confident in my situation in terms of um, like, I don't think it's going to limit me from finding jobs, you know, to talk about those things at this point in my career. And so um, I, I do that. Um, I'm actually going to be on a panel about ADHD at KubeCon, which is pretty exciting um, with a few other people who are in the kind of Kubernetes community that also have ADHD and um, there's going to be some storytelling about um, some of their experiences. So I think that's going to be a lot of fun. I, I, I'm going to spend 60 more seconds on this topic, and then we're going to get into the meat of what this podcast is about, which is you. But, you know, I grew up as a kid in the 70s where it, you were essentially just told, deal with it, get up, move on, stop complaining. And I was a horrible student, and I was really immature and 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 sometimes I wonder if I have some of that, but I, I guess I just learned over time to just fight through it. And maybe now that I'm 50, I just kind of look at it as, you know, I, I, like I don't know how to think about it. Only I think because of the era that I grew up in. And so when I see people talking about this, um, honestly, I'm really confused about it. Just because I and I'm I'm gonna be honest here, like maybe like. 
I feel like sometimes that maybe it was good that everybody just kept pounding into me that just deal with it. This is who you are and move on. And I did. Or would I be even better off if I had the kind of systems and support and, and the things that are like, I'm really confused about it, Rich. Yeah. I mean, everyone's different, but I think that, you know, I wasn't diagnosed until I was an adult and I'm, I was kind of in the same boat as you in terms of like growing up in a, in a time where people didn't understand it. I think that ADD as a diagnosis didn't have actually exist until I was in high school. So it's not like I was caught as a little kid, you know, but I, the signals were all there if someone would have known what to look for. And, and I feel like, you know, I reached a point, the reason why I got diagnosed is I reached a point where I was just, you know, I was in the pandemic. I was in a, a job that I wasn't happy with. I just was, I couldn't do anything. You know, I was like almost paralyzed and, and, and so I knew I needed to get help. And so that's kind of what drove me to, to get the diagnosis, but, but everybody's different and people respond to different things. Um, one of the interesting things is that um, sometimes the sort of typical productivity advice, you know, um, actually can be really harmful for people with who have ADHD because they're not able to do those typical things, right? And then they feel bad about it. I'll tell you this, at least. I had kids when I was, I had my first kid when I was 26. And I think what's gotten me through depression, what's gotten me through being distracted, like what's gotten me through everything to be maintain a level of productiveness is this idea in my head that I have to support these kids and that I can't, I can't falter on that. So anytime I don't want to do something, I kind of bring the kids back into my head and I go, it doesn't matter if you don't want to do it, focus and just get it done. Right? Like that's been the formula for me, I think, to fight through all those years of depression, like whatever the emotion is, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, um, I think that these things are obviously like they're, they're all spectrums. Right. So, so like there's, there's people who, um, you know, have some symptoms of ADHD, but, you know, maybe wouldn't be able to get a diagnosis. And then there's other people where it's, it's so extreme that it's literally a disability, you know, for them. And so, so I think it's, you know, I think the approach you're talking about is fantastic that it works for you. It it wouldn't work for some people, you know, they they just wouldn't be able to do that. No, no, for sure, for sure. But I, 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 I'm I just sharing what has helped me get through a lot of bad decisions, mistakes, um, things like that. Okay, we got to get back to, okay, this podcast is about you. I really want to kind of hear your story and your, and your journey. Uh, but before we start, two things. One, um, Give everybody a uh, like a, the two minute sort of spiel on what you're doing today. What is Rich doing today? Yeah, so I work at this company called Loft Labs. We make um, uh, Kubernetes tools. We are focused a lot on multi-tenancy and self-service for people who are operating Kubernetes clusters. Um, I'm a staff developer advocate there, so I spend a lot of time interacting with the community, um, kind of talking about what it is that we're doing, explaining the importance of it, um, things like that. So that so you're doing exactly what I want. I never want to install Kubernetes or manage a Kubernetes system. I just want to be pointed to one with whatever resources I want and just like that's me. That's yeah. That's I mean, that's really kind of what we do. So like our our commercial product um, lets someone who is on a platform team basically easily share a cluster with a bunch of developers so that they can just grab a, a Kubernetes environment and use it whenever they want. Um, so um, I, I'm somebody who I think self-service is super important. You know, like I've been that person who was waiting around for someone else to do a thing for me. And it's, it's so frustrating when you, you know, are, are losing time when you could be um, doing something that you hopefully enjoy, you know, um, if you, if you like your job. So, um, so I believe really strongly in that. We also have a, an open source project that's become really popular um, called V cluster, which is this thing where people can um, basically create these things that we call virtual Kubernetes clusters, where it's a, it's a control plane inside a namespace on a Kubernetes cluster. And so it feels to the end user like it's a full-blown cluster, 
um, but it's it's uh, just one namespace on a shared cluster. So um, it's been pretty cool. People really like it. If folks want to learn more about it, they can just go to it's just vcluster.com. What I start to get nervous about with the virtualization side of things, and I, again, I don't have a huge amount of experience, but what I is applications starving for CPU and resources because they're not giving full CPUs and and like once everything starts to become virtualized, I get a little nervous not for dev or like but production, making sure we're not starving your applications. Yeah, this isn't um, this doesn't really work that way. So it's like um, it's the the underlying Kubernetes scheduler is still scheduling all the workloads, and so all of that behaves just like normal. It just basically kind of um, the 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 namespaces on the shared cluster each have their own control plane, and so they have their own API server. It's almost like API server federation in a way it would be like another way to think of it. But it's it basically gives you as as an engineer or or developer using that that virtual cluster um it presents itself to you as if it's a full-blown cluster and you can create namespaces and global objects and do a bunch of things that you wouldn't be able to do if you were in a namespace on norm, on a normal kubernetes cluster that's kind of locked down that's really cool uh, you know one last question here one last question are you still seeing growth in this space in terms of shops moving towards Kubernetes? Has it kind of stagnated? Is it going away? Kind of curious where we are today with Kubernetes and usage. You know, I can't, I can't say that I have necessarily the best like industry wide view, you know, from the kind of role that I have, but, but the impression that I get is that it has not stagnated yet. I think there still are people coming on board and, and I think it's important to understand too, that like, Kubernetes is one tool in your toolbox, right? Like as a as an infrastructure person, like I think it's great. I think it's really good for a lot of use cases. It's not going to be the best thing for every use case, you know. There are things like HashiCorp's Nomad, or you know, there's there's lots of different ways that you can run workloads, you know, um, even doing serverless things. And so, I don't, you know, I'm not the kind of person who would tell everybody that they have to use Kubernetes for everything. Um, but I think there are a lot of shops that are using it for like at least some of their workloads. I, I love it as a dev environment once I've got a database and some other things that have to run at the same time. It's so nice to just start it up and, and just use it and all day and not worry about, because that used to be a nightmare, like manually starting this, manually starting that, at least from a dev environment, even if I don't use it in production, just as a dev environment to bring bunch of services up together on a local network is like, I don't know, dude, it's like magical. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that one of the features that we added to the virtual cluster stuff to vCluster recently was the ability to have it even um, install Helm charts when it spins up the virtual cluster. So you can go even a little further in terms of that automation. But um, but yeah, it's, um, you know, I'm pretty old school. I've been around a long time, but, you know, I, I was working in shops in the 2000s, you know, where people were doing Java development and they were trying to spin up all these, you know, Java apps on their own uh, laptops. And um, it was just a nightmare sometimes, you know, and, and I think that um, one of the things that really has been a big focus of, you know, in the industry in the last few years has been, um, you know, improving that developer experience. Um, we have another open source tool. I'm going to keep plugging stuff as long as you let me. Um, we, <laughs> we have another open source tool called DevSpace that's actually a tool more along the lines of what we're talking about. So it basically lets you define a workflow for your project in YAML. And so you can you know, do builds or you can um, do all kinds of stuff from you know, just you know, within this one CLI. Um, so I, I think, you know, like I said, I think it's something that that people are focused on a lot. Um, I don't know if you know Nicole Forsgren, if you know who she is, but um, she she works at GitHub. Um, super smart. She's the one who um, she's one of the co-authors of a uh, book Accelerated that a lot of people um, kind of learned a lot about developer productivity from um, from her research. But um, she co-wrote this paper uh, a while ago where she laid out this, uh, she and her team laid out this thing they call the space framework. And I can't remember all the things that like space is an acronym, you know, um, but, 
but one of the things they talk about in there a lot is is the fact that um, productivity that that people's happiness is part of that, right? And so, like, if your if your workflow is a pain in the butt and you hate doing it, you know, then you're not going to be as productive as an engineer. And and I see a lot more companies really focusing on that. The fact that like people should like enjoy their jobs, right? It's, it's, it's not always going to be the case. We all have to do things we don't want to do, but like as much as possible, I think that we should, we should be trying to, to make it so that people can be productive and be happy. I, I apply that idea when I'm teaching like package oriented design and go, like you're designing APIs all day. You can make an API that is really great to use and makes people happy, or you can make people miserable. Like, what, what do you want to do with this API design, right? Like, you've, we've all been there where, like, I don't even want to come to work tomorrow because I know I have to work with this API, and it's so bad that it's just, yeah. Like, I think that idea of happiness um, and, and and making others productive is incredibly right on and valuable, and we should f strive for that, too, in what we're doing. I like the idea of like doing things for your future self too, you know, that's something that, that I like, like, you know, if you, if you write a better API, future Bill is going to be happier when he uses it. So, yeah. All right. This is, this was really good. I'm glad we had this comment and we're going to get back to it. We're going to get back to it, but Rich, Rich tell me. We've gotten, we've I gotten need... distracted, Bill. <laughs> no, that's just what, this is what this podcast is all about. It's about being distracted, seeing, seeing where things go. <laughs> all right. Tell me what year you graduated high school. I'm going to age you a little bit because oh, I need to wow. know, know tech. You're, here. you're outing me here. This is a, a funny thing about me. So um, people tend to tell me that I look about 10 years younger than I am. Um, it depends. Like, I think that that's maybe slipping a little bit as I get older, but um, I graduated in 1984. So um, you are older than me. Now that I wouldn't have guessed. I am, I am old. Yeah. Nice, dude. I, I, that's when I started high school. I, I graduated in 87. So I, I really didn't realize that I was, uh, dude, that's nice. 84. Okay. <laughs> that's good. That is super cool. So, all right. So here's my first favorite question. If you've listened to podcasts before, you've heard of it. Um, give me that first thought that pops in your head of working on a computer, having that kind of moment where you're like, this is cool. Um, so I think the first one was um, I got my mom to buy for me a thing called the Timex Sinclair 1000, which if people want to Google that, I know there are pictures of it out there somewhere, but it was, you know, this uh, single little kind of chunk of plastic that had these membrane keys on it. And um, you saved and loaded um, your programs to a cassette tape. Um, so uh, it was uh, just dorking around writing basic stuff on, on that computer. Um, I, it's kind of, kind of interesting. I never, I wouldn't say that I I was driven to write code. Like I'm not, my experience is a lot more on the infrastructure side and um, I've written some code. I don't consider myself like a full-time engineer, but, um, but that engagement with the computer, you know, that's something that, that I was drawn to very early and continued to do even, you know, in high school classes and things like that, like long before I got in the industry. Did that unit connect to the back of the television? Because I had one really similar to that that connected to the back of the TV. I think my parents got it at Radio Shack, and I can never remember what this little computer was. But yeah, same idea, cassette. It was it was the cheapest computer you could buy at that point, the cheapest home computer. I think it was about a hundred bucks, which you know this was nineteen seventies money or whatever. So it's it was a, a bit more, but um, but. But I really, I just, um, I loved it. I really did like the idea that you could, you know, um, control the flow of the programs, like in basic. I really liked like doing the the loops and stuff. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. So I, I'm going to guess you did this because I did this and, we, and same sort of story, right? We learned basic early on. And then if you started going to the department stores when they were finally selling PCs there, they'd, they'd have a little program running, like especially if it was a DOS machine, 
right? They had these programs running, and you could break it and then write your own little basic program that would just loop like something probably not terribly nice <laughs> on the screen and you'd walk away. Now, I know, Rich, you did I, that I, a couple of times. I don't, I don't remember doing that. It's possible. The thing that I do remember, the thing that I do remember doing in high school was I wrote a little basic program that kind of simulated um, the output of the computer in the movie War Games. So, um, you know, the Professor Falcon, you know, typing commands and stuff. I do, I do remember doing that. Um, um, but, but yeah, you know, at that point in time, I really, it was just messing around, right? Like I didn't have any goals. I wasn't like, it wasn't like there was a specific app or program I wanted to write, you know, it was just a, a kid messing around. It was like a toy to me. Right. But you're really, when you look back on it now, I mean, knowing basic in the early eighties, right? Like you're kind of ahead of your time. I mean, this is all really brand, brand, brand new stuff. Very few kids are or even playing with this. But as you get into, oh, I'm sorry, go on, go on. Oh, I was just going to say it was, uh, you know, in my school, you know, we had the computer lab in my high school with like a bunch of, you know, the Radio Shack, the TRS 80s or whatever it was back then. Um, but then we had, we had one Apple IIe and that was the computer that everybody loved. Like everybody wanted to get time on the Apple IIe because it had colors. And the mouse and a real UI, and it was really at the time like state of the art magical when you first saw it. Yeah, I'm not sure if there was a mouse with that one. I feel like that might not might not have come until the Mac, but um, but nonetheless, it was yeah, it, it just felt different, you know. It just like the Radio Shacks just felt you know really kind of boring, you know, compared to that computer. Um, that one had a lot more personality, and I think that. In those early years, the Apple people did just an amazing job at like marketing their products and and making them fun. So as you as you're entering high school, what is it that you're kind of interested in? What are you What are you doing? What What is kind of your focus as you're getting into high school? So um, a couple things. So I wrote for my school paper, um, which is something that I really enjoyed, and I did that in college for a bit as well. Um, and then um, the other thing is that I was doing theater stuff. Um, and that actually was my major when I went into college. I was a theater major. Um, so, so those were kind of the two things that really um, consumed me. What, um, so then I guess I remember in high school, every at least once a year, they had a big production of some. I think I tried out one time in eighth grade. I, I, I can't even remember what the play was, but I had to stand up in front of all these people and my eyes are tearing. And it was a really hard sort of like song. It was it was miserable. I don't even know why. Like I don't have very few memories of, as a kid, but I remember like. And then the next kid who we knew were, was going to get it just came up and shined. And I'm like, okay, at least I tried. <laughs> yeah. So I was in seventh grade. Um, it was the very first play that I had a chance to audition for. My sister had done some plays in school and she thought I would enjoy it and encouraged me to try out. So I go and I audition for the very first play and I got the lead. And I was like, all right, you know, and, and here I am, this kid who, you know, has, you know, wasn't really fitting in in the, in the town that I lived in, um, had a lot of self-esteem issues. And suddenly I do this thing and people are clapping for me. And it was like, wow, I love this. <laughs> and I was hooked. What town were you living in? Where were you? Where, where did you go to school? Um, so I first lived in this town in Iowa called Burlington um, until I was about age 10. And then we moved to this really small town. It's called Washington, Iowa. It was like 9,000 people when I was there. And it was the town where the kids from the little towns came to party on the weekends. So um yeah, it was uh, it was really something. I um, I don't have a lot of good things to say about it. <laughs> um, I, but do you I, know why you moved there? Do you? Do, do you my dad. Do, what? My dad had a job there, and so when when we were living in Burlington, he was commuting, and he just got tired of commuting so much, and so so we moved there. And it was it was hard for me because I had been in like an accelerated education program, and one of the things when you learn about ADHD that you know, comes up quite a bit is that if if people with ADHD are interested in what they're doing and they're engaged, 
their symptoms tend to be much, much lower. Like it, it's, it's when they're bored, you know, and they're not challenged. That's when, you know, the, the problems come in, uh, come up. And that was definitely the case for me. And so, you know, at 10 years old, I moved to this city that, you know, this, this town that not only didn't have the accelerated program, but the schools were probably just worse anyway, you know, and, and it took a few years, but, you know, eventually I just got bored. And, and by the time I was in high school, I was either getting A's in classes or just barely passing them, depending on whether I was engaged by them or not. And they all could have been A's, you know, I would, I got the, you know, you should apply yourself conversation so many times from, from teachers and counselors. I, I was a C student. My parents knew that's all I was going to do. And for me, I think it was a maturity level sort of thing. Like, I just really never felt I was mature enough um, all the time. So I didn't take it seriously and I didn't apply myself. And But the same thing, if it was a class that I really enjoyed, I was going to get an A. It wasn't even, it was exactly the same thing. Yeah. And I mean, with me, you know, um, so I'm not sure if this thing still exists, but back then, they had the standardized test that they would give us every year called the Iowa Test of Basic Skills. And I would um, always score in the top percentile in that standardized test, right? And so they knew that I was smart, right? They knew that that I could be doing much better. Um, and so, so yeah, the, and you know, when I went to college, I didn't really know what I was, what I wanted to do. I ended up um, going to community. Well, let's not talk about college this year. Let me, let me, let me keep you in high school for just a little bit longer because it, it sounds like you're you're really excited. You're focused on theater. You're you're getting um, selected. I'm imagine not may, maybe not necessarily the lead in every show, but but you're also not just standing back there like a tree, right? I mean, you're engaged in in all of that. Um, even when you move to this little town, they still have a theater program. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's then why as I started doing that stuff. That oh, in that town, okay. Did that town? I'm just curious. Did that town have adult theater? Like we have a lot of that here in Miami, where um, like local theater. I don't know what it's called. We had a, a community theater. theater. Yeah, okay, and community. I did, theater. I did. I was in some shows there too, as well. As you're ready to graduate high school, you're in this little town. Theater is something you're really passionate about. Have you been even before I ask that question? Have you been doing anything related to technology during these four years or has your focus really been theater, I guess? Uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, in, in high school was when I was taking those classes, those computer classes. So um, that, you know, I took, they didn't have a lot, right? But there were like one or two classes you could take. Um, and then the other thing that I was very interested in was photography. So um, I spent a lot of time in the dark room there at school too. Um, but, but no, the technology stuff for the most part came, came a lot later. Imagine Im back then my dad was a photographer. He had his own dark room in the basement, wasn't allowed in there unless he was there. But I remember in 90, I'm going to say it's 94, 95, getting my dad his first digital camera. They were slow, but they looked like real, they looked like the camera that he had, but it was digital. It was mind blowing to him that he could see what he just took, and if he didn't like it, he could throw it away and do it again. You didn't have that; <laughs> you had to wait to see what what developed, right? Yeah, I mean, if you 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 know, if you actually had a dark room, it was a lot better, right? Because it wasn't like you know, sending your stuff off to the lab and waiting for a week. Like you could at least go in and process the film and like make contact sheets and some prints and get an idea of what's there. But but yeah, I think that that um, in a way the digital photography kind of like took a little bit of the magic away, you know, because there's the, there's the thing where you, you know, you get the film back and you see the, the, the shots that, you know, you didn't even remember taking, you know, that, that you're really excited about. Even some of the mistakes that you made with lighting or the sun sometimes would, would produce something really magical too. Yeah. Or Borer, you know, sometimes like Borer to me ruins a photo, but sometimes it can make it really amazing, you know. So as you're now about to graduate, I'm really curious where your head is. Are you thinking, I want to get out of this little town? Are you thinking university? What, like, like, explain kind of where your head is. Yeah. So, 
so I didn't really know what to do, you know, um, like I, I definitely wanted to continue with the theater stuff. I didn't, um, but I wasn't that person who like, I didn't apply to a bunch of universities, you know, um, at that point, my, my parents had divorced. Um, I was living with my mom. She was running her own business. She didn't know a lot about this stuff. Right. And so, so I didn't really have anyone kind of like guiding me to s some sort of you know, educational goal. And also with the ADHD, you know, I, one of the things about it is that you tend to not think about the future as much, right? You tend to be really rooted in the present. And so I've never been that kind of person who had like the five-year plan for where my life is going or the 10-year plan or whatever, right? So, so I just ended up going to community college because that was just kind of easy. Right. And so, so I went to this and again, it was, I, I mentioned my sister earlier, she had gone to this community college. Right. And so, so that's where I ended up. I was there for a few years and then I came out to Portland, Oregon and transferred to a college out here. What made you just, okay. Okay. Hold on. You can't just say, and then I decided to go to Oregon and like explain that a little bit. And like, what were the steps? Did you apply first? Did you just go out? Like explain that a little bit. So I, um, I badly wanted to get out of Iowa at that point and I didn't really know what to do. And I have a really small family. It's not like I had friends or family in other States, you know? Um, and one of the administrators at the community college that I was going to, who liked me, um, he had worked out at a college in Portland and he thought I would like it out here. And so he said, Hey, you should really go check it out. And so he actually helped set this up. He was like super kind. Like um, he, he basically helped me get out here and got me a place to stay for like a weekend, you know, or, or something. And I came out and I looked around and I really liked it here. And so, um, so he knew a guy at a, at a community college out here in Portland um, and basically got me like a little theater scholarship to, to like come out to this community college. And so um, that's what I did. Um, if it wasn't for that guy intervening, like, and, and helping me make it out of Iowa, I have no idea what would have happened. Like, was he somebody that you would just talk to? Or was he somebody like, like, so he got a sense that you needed, you really needed to get out of there? I think he did. I think that he, um, I think that he probably saw me as someone who, you know, had a lot of creativity and energy and, and wanted to encourage that. So, um, yeah, he was a super nice guy. I've always, um, I don't know when I was in college, I always got along really well with professors and, and with, you know, th those kinds of folks. Um, um, I, I'm somebody who I definitely appreciate teachers. Um, I think that's, that's the context I heard about you in, you know, was people talking about your trainings and, and your teaching. Um, and, and yeah, he's somebody who I would, I would often go into the office, you know, and just have random conversations with him. So you must have been excited because now you're out of school, you're out of Iowa, you're, you're able to focus. I mean, I'm sure it's still a liberal arts degree, but you, you have to focus on theater now. So how was that first semester um, in Portland for you? Was it everything you hoped it would be? Um, I don't remember specifically the first semester, but I do... Um, I did definitely enjoy my time there at that school. So the, um, the theater stuff was great. I actually did a little bit of playwriting along with acting. So, um, that was in the days where, uh, I was banging out scripts on a typewriter and, and I really enjoyed that. And, um, you know, I'm sure that I would cringe if I look back on them, you know, but at the time it was super fun. And, and, um, I also ended up on my, um, on the college speech team. So I was doing debate, um, and, and some other kinds of, um, you know, speech events that they had. And I really enjoyed debate. I was going to ask you, do you think your theater training what helped you or hurt you with debate? Were you able to leverage any of the, the skill set that you got from theater? You know, it, it's interesting because, um, there, one of the other speech events was this event where you would like basically stand up and read off a script from like a play. And I can't even remember what they called the event, but it was basically acting, but like with the script. 
And I was terrible at that event, you know, and I thought I would just crush it because I had all this experience acting. And, and I think it was probably because of the fact that, you know, you don't have a scene partner, you know, it's, it's like, it was just a whole different kind of thing. It was like a monologue basically with a, you know, and you have to pretend you're reading off the script, but of course everybody had it memorized, you know, and, and um, I was terrible at that, but I, I did pretty well at debate. I think for me, debate was a lot more about like, that's where I learned about argumentation and logic and things like that. And, and those were things that I think I, I just kind of naturally fell into. Um, I kind of had a, a logical mind. And so it was easy for me to like understand, you know, where the holes in somebody else's argument were and, and, and things like that. But I imagine that debate also requires a lot of focus on research, reading. You want to be well prepared on both sides of that. And that requires a tremendous amount of attention. So your ADHD didn't kind of interfere with some of that, or you were just so into it. Like, again, it just goes off to the side. Yeah, I, th I think that was more it. I was super engaged with that stuff. And like the, the topics that we, that we did were like really interesting. Like one year I remember um, it was, this was the time where the Nicaraguan civil war was going on, right. With the, the Sandinistas and the Contras, like people who aren't as old as us won't necessarily remember all this, but, but it was, you know, like the war was going on and our debate topic for the year was about this war and whether like the U S S actions in it, you know, intervening in it were correct or not. And so it was really exciting. Like I, I would get the New York times every day, you know, and like look for articles that would like, you know, fit into the debate topic. And, and I was, I was super engaged. So I think in, in the ADHD really wasn't a problem there. That was the Oliver North stuff. Was Oliver North involved yes. in that? I think yeah, okay, that, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember if that part had happened by the time that we were, that we were doing the, the debate on it or not. Yeah, I think it might have been earlier than that, but I'm not positive. So you're getting all of this, I'm going to call it kind of classical training in theater, communications, debate. Um, you're able to leverage a lot of kind of academics behind all of that. You're now in Portland. You're, what's, how, long, how long does it take you to graduate from this school? Do you graduate from this school? How long does it take? Because you've already spent, what, a couple of years prior to going there? <laughs> you're starting to you're starting to understand the timeline of my shoddy academic history. So so I was in college for like six years and um, dropped out twice, technically. So I um, I went to that community college for like two years. I transferred downtown to Portland State University um, and was there for a while and you know, it's so, it's just really classic ADHD stuff because I was actually very close to graduating. I was like, it was like my senior year um, of the program, but there was a class I had to take that I absolutely hated and it was a required class. And I just, I flunked it. It was, um, it was a lighting design class and you had to, um, this was in the old days, you know, we, we had to do all these drawings, you know, drafting with like, you know, um, uh, you know, on paper and, and I wasn't good at it and I just hated it. And, um, I couldn't get my brain to engage with it. So I literally, I failed like, you know, this required class. And at the same time, at that point in time, I had started, um, doing improv comedy. Um, and I was, uh, by that point, part of uh, a professional comedy group that some of my professors had started. And so we were actually getting paid to do comedy shows like during the day at schools. So at like, you know, junior high and high school assemblies, we would come in and, and perform. And so I was making a little bit of money at that. And, and those gigs a lot of the time were during the day when my classes were. And so I, you know, I finally reached this point where I was like, Hey, uh, this is actually my job, right? Like, why am I taking classes to do this thing that I am getting paid for, you know? So um, I ended up dropping out. And you never went back and finished the last few credits that you needed? 
Uh, no, later on, I did go back. Once I got into computing, there was a point where I went back and I started taking some classes um, to prepare me to go into computer science. But um, but again, I dropped out because I got a job in tech. <laughs> but we'll get to that, I'm assuming. So I, I find this completely normal, interesting and normal because you're at a point where you're just like, the degree isn't going to get me anything beyond where I, and I, I'm, I'm where I want to be. The degree's not going to get me anything. If anything, it's interfering with where I want to be. So I'm just going to push that aside. It's it, and like, I don't care about it. And you start um, getting paid now to do the improv. But did you, were you just living in the moment again? Or did you see some sort of future? Um, I mean, it was probably some of both, you know, um, I did tend to live in the moment a lot. Um, but I also did sort of have a plan. So while I was, um, in that theater program, um, besides the improv comedy, the other thing that I was doing that I really loved was, um, I started directing plays and I found that, um, that like much more engaging, even than being an actor. I really love that process of like getting a group of people together and kind of guiding a collaborative vision of how the script should be interpreted. Um, and so in addition to doing the improv after, after I dropped off, after I dropped out, I also um, was, uh, I guess I would call it a semi-professional director at a local theater in town that I helped run. Can you give me two minutes on what directing actually is because i see it for movies and i see it and my brain goes there's got to be a line maybe it's like managing a t project where there's got to be a line where you got to let the actor do their thing it's like can you just give me like a two minute i, I really want to understand what you're doing and why it's so important to have you there yeah i mean people do it differently too so my view of it is not the same view that you're going to get from somebody else but but I think that really, you know, especially in filmmaking, but also in theater, it's really a lot about shaping the kind of collaborative vision of the material, right? So a director in, in, um, in a movie isn't, they're not the cinematographer, right? So they're not the one choosing which lens is going to get used on a shot. They're not, they don't write the script. They don't design the sets. They, they really are responsible for for guiding all those other people, all those other department heads and, you know, making sure that the thing is like a cohesive whole um, um, and working with the actors. And to me, that was my favorite part. And people approach that really differently. Um, I had a, I had a professor in college and when he would direct a play, um, he would literally uh, get out a chessboard and he would figure out who was standing where at every moment of the play. And, you know, when we started rehearsals, he would say, all right, on this line, you go and walk over to the vase, you know, or whatever. Right. And my view of it was completely the opposite. Like I wanted to, I wanted to incorporate the actor's instincts, you know, um, as much as possible, unless I thought those were contrary to the script itself. Um, and by that, I mean, like in a detrimental way, because sometimes there are things that are subtext or whatever, where like they are, you know, the character really isn't doing what they're saying. Um, but uh, but my my view of it was I wanted the actors to really be the ones who who brought the characters to life. Um, and between that and the improv comedy, um, that all had a lot of a lot of impact on me, like the way that I view collaboration. Um, the the improv especially like the thing about that is you get a group of people together it's maybe like five people and you come in and you do a scene together you have no idea what's going to happen and what what i learned is that there are times you know at times you fall flat on your face right but then there are other times where you create this amazing thing together and it's a thing that none of you individually could ever have imagined because it's made up of the imagination of everyone in that group, right? And and that had a huge impact on me. And it's it's really it's influenced me a lot in terms of like how I collaborate with people in in my tech career too. Whose line is it anyway? Was one of my favorite shows. Those the people that they had at least on the U.S. side 
were so brilliant together. I would love watching them laugh before it was their turn. You could just see their brain just going, oh my God, I can't believe they just did that to me. Like, how did this person, do, you know, I loved that show. I, I loved more the human interactions because they knew and loved each other than sometimes the skit itself, just knowing where it had to go. Yeah. So funny thing, I uh, I actually did a scene with Wayne Brady once um, at at an improv comedy tournament. And it was a scene where it was like the the format of the improv comedy itself was a competition. So it's like these two teams competing against each other. And so he and I were like competing against each other in the scene and he just crushed me. Like he just was like, like I, it was, it was humiliating. Yeah. This was before he was on the show. He was in Orlando, I think, um, like with an improv group before he, before he ended up on the show. Um, yeah, he was so good. But I, I will say that he was brilliant at the improv, but the few times that he, I think, tried to move into a more controlled sort of acting environment, it didn't really, I didn't feel like it fit him. Like he really needed to be in that improv. It's a different thing, you know, and, and um, it really is, uh, you know, if you've ever been on a movie set, I guess a lot of people don't have that opportunity, but I was an, an extra on a few movies when I was younger and like, you just don't imagine like watching a movie, what it's really like, but it's like when somebody's doing a take of, of there's a close up on them. Right. And they're, they're given some lines, maybe some dialogue or maybe even like a short monologue or whatever. Um, it may not even be the other actor that's actually in the scene that they're interacting with. It might be like an assistant, you know, some sort of PA or someone who's just there, like giving the other lines back to them. Right. And so it's, it's such a different world to like, actually, you know, do that as opposed to like, you know, being in, you know, live theater or improv or something like that, where you really do have a very active um, kind of spontaneous thing going on. No, I can, I, the only thing I can equate it to and appreciate that is when I had to switch to teaching in front of a camera and, you know, I saw some people on, on a screen, but it, it took twice the amount of energy to try to pretend that I was in the room with them. And Absolutely. there's no way you're going to have the same sort of anything, you know, in that environment. It took me a long time to even figure out how to do it in a way where I think people felt like I was in the room with them, but it's twice the amount of work. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is a really similar thing. And I think that for those actors who are who are doing things, you know, um, on camera, I think that, you know, it depends, you know, their time, they may actually have the other actor may be there, you know, interacting with them. But um, but I feel like you you sort of have to do more of it yourself internally, whereas with like the live theater, it's a lot about listening to the other person and kind of like interacting with their energy. OK, so. You're, you, you left school, you're in this improv, you're doing, all, so what happens, man? What, what happens? How long are you doing that before the next sort of change in your life? Yeah. So I do that for a few years. Um, oh, <laughs> we ended up doing something really stupid in retrospect. We, uh, we sort of, um, ended up kind of, uh, looking our gift horse in the mouth. So we did this thing where we're doing these shows in the schools and, you know, I was making a living. When I say making a living, I was sleeping on somebody's couch, right? So it's not like I was making real money, you know, but um, but at some point we just kind of decided as a group that, hey, this thing is kind of beneath us, right? Like performing for these middle school kids all the time. And, and so we were going to stop doing it. And so at that point, you know, uh, I didn't have any income. Um, my job had been working at... Um, uh, market research companies. So I was doing phone surveys and that was a really good job for an actor because you could be pretty flaky. Um, like if you had an audition come up, you know, um, you could just call in sick or whatever. And, and those companies are like so desperate for people, especially people who are like smart and creative that like you could get away with a lot. And, and so, um, I did that for years. Um, they kept trying to promote me. They kept saying, Hey, you should be a supervisor. And I was like, Nope, I don't want any responsibility here. Um, and then finally I got to a point where, you know, 
Um, I, I had some bad experiences directing plays. I did a couple of um, uh, actual pro professional productions, you know, where I like directed some union actors and I did um, one show that ended up like doing a little short run um, off Broadway. And I just had really bad experiences at that point. Um, and I decided that like, this wasn't a thing that I wanted to like do for a living. living. Um, and so I just said, all right, you know, I'll, I'll be a supervisor. And I ended up um, being the data collections manager and ended up managing a department of like about, I don't know, 30, 40 people and had no idea what I was doing, right? Like I'm like 20 some years old and never been a manager before. I'm sure I was terrible at it. Like I probably would be like uh, mortified at some of the things I probably said to people back then. Um, but part of, part of the, during that process, like working at that job, the IT guy left and they were like, um, hey, do you want to take care of the Novell network and like swap the backup tapes and do stuff like that? And so I started doing that. And, and then after a while, I reached a point where I was like, hey, you know, if I'm going to be the IT guy, I should get paid what IT guys get paid, not what market research people get paid. This had to be like 92, right? I mean, you have to be talking about Novell networks are big now in ninety. Um, that's in the probably late about 80s, right. Early yeah, yeah, because I ended up, um, I ended up um, using Linux um, not long after that, and I was very early on in Linux. Like when I was using it, it was at the point where you downloaded floppy disks, and I think that was like around then, like early nineties. So yeah. So you decide that you're not getting paid enough. And you tell them and they laugh at you and now you got to find another job? Um, I don't know that I, that even happened. I don't even know that I told them that. Like, I think that I just, so I decided I was going to go back to college, right? And like I mentioned earlier, I started taking these core classes because I'd been a theater major and I didn't have math or science classes hardly at all. And so I started taking those and then I got a job um, as like a tech support person. Um, and I was doing that part-time at first for one of these companies that does like outsource tech support. So I was like supporting like some Intel products and stuff, but I didn't work for Intel. While you were working the other job, while you were managing 30 people. No, this was after, work, this was doing. after I left. This was after. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 And so I started doing that. And then, um, at about the same time, um, I, I got interested in the internet and this was a totally random thing, but, um, do you, because you are also old, do you remember um, multi-user dungeons, MUDs? I wasn't, if, if that's gaming, the answer is no. It was gaming. I wasn't in, so, yeah, I wasn't into any of that. All right. So it's like those text-based games like Zork where, you know, or whatever, where you're like, I want to go West. And then you type in West. Um, it was like that, but it was also like an MMO. So there were other people and um, you could program the games too. So there was a point you you reached where, you know, you would get promoted by the people running the game to the point where you could actually code stuff. Um, so I started playing one of those games with a friend and um, I just got hooked. And um, I started learning about the internet and there was a point where so I, I would dial into a sun server, right? And I would run the mud client on the sun server. Um, and that was how I played the game. And then at some point I somehow heard that there was this new thing called Linux where you could run Unix on your own computer. And then um, uh, the, the sun server was really laggy with all these people doing all these different things. And I was like, oh, I could just like run the client on my own computer and I wouldn't have to worry about all the lag. Um, and that was kind of my introduction to Linux as I got, I got into it through gaming. What year are we talking? Are we talking 90? I first saw the internet in 96. I think that's when the first uh, time I really This is definitely really before then. Um, so I can't date it exactly, but but I do remember that my first PC that I had that I ran Linux on was, well, maybe it was around then because I, I had Windows 95 and I dual booted it. Um, and I got it like right after Windows 95 came out. Um, but I think I'd already been doing a little bit of Linux stuff on my friend's computer before that. Um, when I first started out, 
<laughs> I would go to the local Linux users group here in town, um, which still exists. Um, I would go there and it was like eight people sitting around a conference table. That was like the people in Portland who knew about Linux and were into it. You went back to school to get some sort of IT level degree. It wasn't computer science, was it? It was, what was the degree that you were going back? I, I wanted to get into a computer science program. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, again, same thing happened. So I get, um, I'm, I'm doing that tech support, um, I think while I was taking the classes and then I get a job at an internet provider in town as like a support person, a full-time job. And so again, I'm like, okay, I don't need to go to school. I just got a job. And so, um, I'm doing tech support and, um, I, I'm like helping people set their modem init strings, which is something that people nowadays will have no idea of, but like, uh, I was, I was just that person who was taking calls from people who couldn't get their email set up or whatever. Um, but I had been playing around with Linux quite a bit, you know, on my own and really loved it. And, and so I get hired at the shop, the small internet provider. My boss, um, is, uh, knows a lot more than me about Unix and Linux, but we were using Red Hat and I knew more about Red Hat than he did. So I knew about RPM and all these other things. And so it gets to the point where he's like calling me, like asking me to help him fix things, right? And about that time, I got a job offer from another company where they were gonna promote me to be a system administrator, a very entry-level entry sysadmin. What I don't understand is where these opportunities to do tech support and stuff are coming from. Like suddenly you just, you, you got this job, you got that job, but are you out looking for this? Are people coming to you with these opportunities? Can you just explain a little bit how you're finding these jobs? You know, I don't even remember that one. You know, it's so long ago. It was like 95, 96, something like that. But, um, but I was in that local Linux users group and I might've heard about it through there. Um, I think that's probably how I heard about the internet provider. There were only a handful of internet providers here in Portland at that point in time. Um, so it was, it was likely through there. And then over the next few years, actually, I, um, I heard about, you know, several jobs like through, through that group of people. So, um, being part of that Linux users group really did help me a lot, like in my early career. So what's this now? I, I can't imagine that you could do one of these over the phone tech support jobs for a long time because I would imagine that after six weeks, you've basically gotten every question you're going to get and you're bored at this point. Yeah. I mean, so, so part of it is that like, even during that time where I was in that role, technically I was already starting to do sysadmin work. Right. So like, like I said, my boss was calling me and asking me about things. And then as time goes on, I start to realize that like the stuff is a mess there. Right. So, so my boss had, pri had fired the previous systems administrator like a few months before I joined the company and he hadn't replaced him. And so there was nobody maintaining the systems. And so like stuff wasn't patched. And like one day I go into my boss's office and <laughs> he shows me his screen and somebody is logged into our mail server as root and they're downloading the password file with FTP. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my, oh my God. God, this is so bad. And this was before like people nowadays are probably familiar with like the the passwords in the password file is being encrypted, you know, with shadow passwords. But but at that point in time, like like that was an extra step you had to take to like encrypt the password file, and that hadn't been done. And so they literally were downloading the Playtex passwords, and um, yeah, just brutal. And stuff was getting owned all the time. And my boss knew I was interested in this stuff, and I actually had a, an interest in security that developed. And so um, I ended up like, you know rebuilding a bunch of our servers and stuff and like updating them to like new versions of uh, newer versions of Linux. And, and about that time I got this other job offer, um, through the Linux users group, this guy that I knew, um, could tell that I had a lot of potential and had me take like a, I think it was like a, a little Python coding test. And I had never written any Python, but I like boned up enough to be able to like, it was a take home test and, and I did it and he offered me a job and, um, I didn't, 
I was kind of on the fence about it. And I went to my boss where I was working and I said, Hey, these guys want to hire me. And so, um, he promoted me to be a system administrator then and gave me a raise and stuff. Yeah, and so we're not, that was we're not losing rich. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. actually regret it looking back. Um, it was, uh, I had, I had fun there in some ways. Um, I was very much like the big fish in the little pond. And had I gone to that other shop, there were some like really experienced like Unix admins there. And I think I would have learned like a ton from them, you know, had I, had I gone and, and done that. So I think that like, if I were to look back on my career, that was kind of a misstep, but, um, but it was good. And, you know, I had a lot of fun. It was just crazy days back then, you know, our whole network was on the internet. There wasn't a firewall. Like all of the computers, all of the servers were directly connected to the internet with public IP addresses. It was just ridiculous. That means you had no idea who was on your network at any given time. I uh, know. <laughs> nope. Um, you know, and so, and I did some things like I set up host firewalling and stuff, you know, which like none of that existed. And I set up the TCP wrappers so we could, you know, reject connections. But why was the network connected to the internet open anyway were people at home or wanting to like access machines I, I don't even know that i could answer that at this point i mean i think that i think the answer was just that you know my boss was super busy and you know that was just how things were set up but it was just um, kind of I cool mean, to be able to yeah there could have been a firewall for sure um um but yeah uh so um so i was there for a few years and um and then um, the company got sold and I was pretty unhappy with the way it all went down and decided I wanted to find another job. And um, my next job that I got was at WebMD. Um, oh, so really? This was, yeah, yeah so what this year was like 98. 98. Um, and at that point it was like one of the hottest stocks on Wall Street, you know, like people were saying, like this company is going to be the Microsoft of healthcare, you know, things like that. And um, the site was getting a huge amount of traffic, like even more than nowadays. Um, it was a really big internet destination. They were taking out Super Bowl ads. And so I'm working on a team there and I start kind of falling into this role where I'm like doing deployments of code, um, which was all manual back then. It was like running scripts. And so I was doing deployments and configuring the apps and um, troubleshooting problems with them. So I was no longer worried about the underlying stack, right? Like I, I, I did a little bit, like I would like build servers and stuff like that. But for the most part, I was worried about the kind of application level. Um, but this wasn't a monolithic website. I, I think of WebMD as just this big content based, maybe CMS, but website, not so at that point, so we had front end servers and the front end servers ran, <laughs> oh my God, we ran a custom web server that was written in Java. So we had a guy that worked at, for us who was a brilliant Java guy. Like he had worked at Sun, like on the Java team and um, super smart. And so he, he writes this custom web server in Java. And so that's on the front end host. And then there was a, uh, uh, middle tier um, that had some like application logic in it and stuff. And then there were databases on the back end. That's interesting. So it wasn't all just static web content. They, I guess, I, yeah, it wasn't static web content. It was some custom CMS. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and then I guess you had your own data centers too, because in 98, there's no cloud yet. You have to run your own data center. Yeah. Yeah. So we had, um, we had stuff hosted in Atlanta, I think mainly, um, a bunch of the team was there. And so, um, you know, when back then it was just crazy. We had like three web servers that ran webmd.com, three web servers. <laughs> they were on a load balancer and I would deploy code to them like one at a time. I would do like a rolling update of them. I would take one of the three servers out of the load balancer. I would run the scripts on it, put it back in and, and rotate through them that way. Um, and, and I fell into this role that ended up being a role that I, I performed for a number of years that I would call like an application administrator where I was doing that sort of stuff. I was doing deployments, I was configuring apps, troubleshooting problems with them. And I continued to do that at another company. Um, and that was the kind of role I was in for 
I don't know, probably like 12, 13 years, you know, of my career. Um, but you must have, okay, you must have over those 10 or 12 years seen some form of uh, tech change to make that better, more automated, more uh, reliable, as opposed to just, like, I remember, just go to the web server, update the website, say a prayer, figure out how you sync that up with the database before you do it, right? But what is over, so even if you're bouncing companies over a decade, like, what are you seeing in terms of tech? Yeah, so the, you know, a number of things, you know, virtualization starts to come in. Um, I think the the really big thing for us, though, was uh, microservices. You know, that was one of the really big changes. And so we, uh, you know, initially when I moved on to the next company, they had like three Java services that ran the whole, you know, the whole site. And then um, as time went on, you know, uh, I mean, it was, do you remember SOA? Service-oriented architecture. Oh, yeah, I guess I remember the the acronym, but I I never liked acronyms. <laughs> yeah, so it was uh it was kind of the precursor to microservices, you know. So we started like building more services, and the idea was that they could run on any host or whatever. Um, and um, but it was actually sort of near the latter part of my time at that company that the the really big change that came in is we started using Puppet. And we started um, uh, using it to like build our systems and and also deploy, uh, not deploy, but configure the applications like it managed the app configs. And um, that that sort of configuration management infrastructure as code thing, you know, um, that was really for me the big change. You know, um, I really got caught up in that. Um, the <laughs> it's kind of funny how it happened. But wait, 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 before you tell me that story, which company introduced Puppet and was there wide acceptance of bringing this tech in? Because I've, I've seen some shops where it's like, we're not changing anything because it works. And then other shops that are just so hurting that they'll try anything. Like, what was your situation? It was a, it was a little startup. Um, you wouldn't have heard of it. We got eventually bought by this company called Heartland Payment Systems that is um, maybe famous for if you if people want to Google them um, for having at at the point in time where they bought us out they they announced it just within like six months later that they had been the victim of the biggest credit card breach in history at that point <laughs> and so so that that was that's the thing that most people probably know them for but um but but actually no the um uh, people. Uh, people within our little startup, you know, were responsible, were really responsive to this idea. And, and it was really the system administrators there who were the ones who were pushing it. Um, I wasn't, but, but what ended up, ended up happening is that they all left for other jobs. And so suddenly one day I was the puppet guy, right? Because I was literally like the only one left. And so they sent me to training at the puppet office and I was there for a few days um, I fell in love with the place um, and the people and everything. Um, there were a bunch of women engineers there. I was like, what? Women engineers? Like I had hardly worked with any in my career up until that point. And um, just the culture there and everything, I fell in love with it. I, I became part of that community for a few years. And eventually I ended up getting a job there myself. So um, that, was, that was my last job. Um, as like an ops person. So I was in SRE there um, for like a year and a half. Um, so wait a second, wait a second. When you, when you join Puppet, you have to move out of Portland or you can still stay in Portland? No, no, no. They were based here actually. Yeah, that was really before remote work was like a regular thing, right? Still, so, so like I was just looking for jobs in Portland. I wasn't really thinking about going anywhere else. I'm kind of curious. I don't know what year we're talking now. I guess we're talking maybe 2006 or something. No, it was much later than that. Um, I think I left there. I left there in 2017. I think maybe it was a little bit earlier. Um, but and I had been there for like maybe a couple of years. You don't go over there to work on the core product. You go over there as an SRE. What are you SREing, if that's a word, over there? Yeah, so we were, um, the team that I was on was responsible for like our core infrastructure. 
um, there. So like storage and virtualization and, and all of those things. But the other thing that we were responsible for was, you know, we used Puppet internally. And so we were the people who owned like the internal Puppet infrastructure. And one of the things that I ended up like working on as time went on was um, uh, how we dog fooded Puppet. And so when I, when I showed up day one, um, they were actually not even running the latest version of the Puppet Enterprise product. They were like a few versions behind. And I was like, what? And, and um, the thing was like, you know, anyone who's shown up at a new job, you know, like you don't really know what's going on at first. You don't, you know, it takes some time to understand the architecture and, and, and all of that. But like, I knew how to upgrade Puppet, right? I had done that already. And so I was like, this is something I could contribute, you know? So, so I got us running on the latest version and, and people were really excited about it. And, and so we went from that to um, eventually having a program where like dog fooding, the product was, you know, a, a big part of my team's responsibility. And I was like the point person for that. And it was actually pretty cool. We, we ended up getting to the point where we were running. So a, a big release would go out, you know, a major version or whatever. Um, we would keep running that, you know, as the next development cycle went, you know, and just pull in all the new changes. So like every, every couple of weeks after the sprint, the engineers would cut us some builds and we would run those. And so we were, you know, by the time they were, I think on us like a six months release cycle for, at that point. And so by the time the six months, you know, is up and we release the product, we've been running it like the whole time. Um, and so. Yeah, I, that's what I want to hear, Rich. I don't want to hear that you're not already putting mileage on the next release at whatever the company is. Put, put the company name in there, right? <laughs> that's not. That's a little scary. It was a it was a great story for us, you know, like like being able to tell customers, hey, you know, this thing that just shipped, we've been running it internally for six months, you know. Um uh so that was that was my last like ops role. Um at that point I'm God, I don't even know how old, you know, like late forties maybe, and I'm like, I just have to get out of being on call, you know. I've been in on-call rotations for like 20 some years at that point. And I'm like, I just, I need to move on. Um, I wasn't really um, as engaged with the work at that point either. You know, um, the funnest thing to me was more like interacting with the product people and, and the other people over this dog fooding program that we were doing. And so I was like, I need to like pivot. And I actually ended up getting laid off and, um, that was the thing that prompted it, but, but I was, I was really interested in product management at that point, you know? Um, and that was partly because I, I like talking to people and that was part of the product manager's job, right. was like talking to customers and finding out what their, you know, what their pain points are and things. Um, but then I, I did it for a few months and I didn't really enjoy it. And that was when I moved into DevRel. So I've been doing DevRel now for. Where did you, where did you try that at Puppet? But you were you you tried the product management puppet. No, there's a there's a startup called Sensu. They make monitoring software, and that was the place where um, I I tried to do the product management, and um, they actually ended up laying me off too. I went through this brittle period where I got laid off like over and over, um, and you know I I really like those guys. It was like, no hard feelings, you know. They they just you know had hired too many people too fast, you know. Um, but it was good for me because I, I really wasn't enjoying the work. And so it gave me a chance to sort of take a step back. And, and that was when I decided I wanted to give DevRel a try. And I think that was maybe three years ago. And so I'm on like my third, fourth DevRel role. Um, started off as a community manager and then moved more into like being a developer advocate. And, you know, one thing that you learn in DevRel is that the titles don't really mean that much. Like they, they give you a sort of a bit of an idea what somebody focuses on, but like what a developer advocate does can be radically different depending on, you know, what company you're working for. Yeah, uh, I, I like to consider myself doing DevRel. I call myself a community engineer at the end of the day. Like I'm still engineering, right? But it's really focused on helping the community. I like that term better than DevRel, to be honest with you. 
Uh, and that's what I do too. I really like that. I don't think I've heard that before, community engineer. Yeah, I, I, and I think it's, I, I'm gonna, one of the reasons I came up with the title is because I can't tell you how many times I saw somebody on stage that was DevRel and I just didn't feel like they had the engineering chops. And I started, started seeing people around me just tune out really quickly because if there's somebody there that's supposed to be technical and they're not coming across technical and you're seeing that over and over again, you just now start lumping everybody into that sort of bucket, right? Oh, they're DevRel. They don't really know what they're doing. They're just going to talk about it. Um, and so I started thinking about really like I am engineering. And so and we're focused on community. And I think you're, you're, you're probably doing very much the same thing, right? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of what I've been doing over the last few years was, you know, has been talking to the community about, you know, the, the products and projects that the companies are building. Um, uh, trying to talk about ideas that are important. Um, it's kind of funny when you mentioned the not having engineering chops, because I would kind of say that's me because I'm not really that much of an engineer, but then my background is more on the op side. So, so really, you know, I tend to work for companies where those are the customers, right? Like the platform engineers and, and, and people like that. And so, so for me, it's not really, I don't write a lot of code. I don't do much of that, that stuff at all. It's more, um, what I'm doing more is kind of leveraging my experience in the infrastructure world. And also um, it, it's kind of funny, you know, we started off talking so much about my theater background and the debate and all that stuff. And, and I feel like moving into DevRel that it all kind of came full circle because I feel like those things are my strengths, right? The soft skills and communication and things like that. And, and for years, I was doing technical work where I really wasn't leveraging those things much, you know. And so now I've come to this point where, like, I'm I'm leveraging my experience in, you know, in operations and infrastructure and my understanding of the customers, of the people in those roles and, like, what they face and what their struggles are, um, along with those those communication skills and creativity and things like that. So it's been a really good fit for me. But I, I want to make it clear, like you're engineering how all of that infrastructure works and stays up. And I can't do any of that engineering. I have zero experience there. So like just because you write writing code doesn't make you an engineer, right? There's engineering that has to happen everywhere. Yeah. And I didn't think that was directed at me, but but I but I have low self-esteem. So I direct things at me anyway. <laughs> No, I, 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 that's why I said I think you're still, it's still community engineering. It's just how do you engineer your systems to keep running and to grow and adapt and, and all that. Um, so he, here's a couple of questions. I, I see, I see this role. I, I see this role in two phases. One is you're out there trying to help people. Um, not make the same mistakes that you've made and try to giving give them a head start whether it's a six month head start or 12 month head start so they don't have to go through the same learning curve and pain the other side is your clients and and being available to them and working on special projects which allows you to continue to grow as an engineer right I, I think if you're not doing both then one side of that's going to suffer eventually and it, it kind of hurts the person in that role, right? And then I think the third thing, and I want to kind of get all your thoughts on this. The third thing is, is how are you measuring success? How is the company measuring your success? Is that aligned and what are the expectations? So maybe like those three things. So what was the first one again? I've already, <laughs> I have ADHD. No, 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 yeah. The, the, the first one is, is what are you doing day in and day out in terms of what do you think your role is day in day out? I think it's it's producing materials to help people with the learning curve, and I think it's helping clients and special projects. That's me. That's what I think. Kind of thing. Like, what do you what do you think it is? Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. Um, I, uh, you know, in some ways, um, a lot of what I'm trying to do still, at least at the company that I'm at now. 
um, is, uh, you know, we're still pretty new, you know, our products only like maybe a year and a half old, something like that. And so a lot of it for us is still brand awareness. So I'm, I'm just, you know, even just trying to get the word out about what it is that we're doing is, is a big part of it. So, you know, I would say that it overlaps with marketing in some ways that way. Um, although it's not about generating leads, right. It's, it's about, you know, getting people engaged in, in what we're doing, but it's, um, but I think that like in terms of the customers, it's interesting. Like I don't really interact with our, our paid customers that much. Um, the company that I'm at, we, um, we have a lot of open source projects that relate to what we're doing and I'm focused there a lot more. And so, so like, you know, I do talk to the, the commercial customers some, but I'm a lot more focused on the open source projects, especially that one that I mentioned early um, in our conversation, the, the virtual cluster stuff, that's, that's um, a lot of what I spend my time working on. And so, you know, some of it is speaking, some of it is writing. Um, I do a podcast about the Kubernetes community. That's, that's actually my own thing. Like I own that, but that's um, kind of part of my job too, because it, you know, um, like, like this is sort of a, <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's an angle on it that some people don't like, but I mean, in a way it's sort of like being like an influencer, you know, like, like I've, you know, developed a following. I've met a lot of people in the community the last few years. Um, that's, that's all been based on really authentic engagements that I've had with people. And the fact that I do this podcast that I was doing on my own time and my own money, you know, um, but but I've come to the point where, you know, I have a voice in the community, you know, and so that's that's part of um, part of why I'm employed. But um, but I think that, you know, with DevRel specifically, it can mean a lot of different things, like I said, and and a lot of that actually has to do with where you sit on the org chart. And so when you're talking about measuring things, you know, typically DevRel um, teams sit um, either under marketing or under like product or engineering, one of the two. And as you can probably guess, like those are very different things, right? Like if you're under a marketing team, you know, maybe you are like, you know, supposed to be contributing to like generating leads and things like that. And, and it's really hard with DevRel because it's like, you give a talk at a conference and maybe someone goes out and buys your software, but like, you have no idea that that happened, right? It's almost impossible to measure. And, and people come up with all these kind of tricks to try to like, you know, measure that, but, but it's really difficult. So it's kind of funny. Um, people talk about this a lot in DevRel. There's a lot of arguments, um, on Twitter, like maybe every few weeks or so about like, how should you measure DevRel and what are the right metrics to look at and stuff. And, and I'm on one of the extremes and the, the extreme that I'm on is that it's really difficult to measure this stuff. And like, for the most part, people are just kind of fooling themselves with, with the metrics they invent. Um, when I came into the job that I'm at, um, and I came in really early. I was like employee number four. Right. So, so at that point, um, you know, there was, uh, it was just booting up the whole program and, and I talked to our CEO and I said, Hey, listen, we could spend, you know, um, a month or three months, like defining how we want to measure this thing, or we could just start doing some stuff. Right. And, and that for the most part has been our approach. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate in a way in that I'm at a company where, the CEO does believe very strongly in what we're doing The both of the co-founders do. And so they understand the importance of this stuff. And, and there's some people that work at companies where like the reason they're gathering DevRel metrics is to justify the line in the budget for DevRel, right. Um, to, to, to say, here's the impact we're having. So please keep giving us budget. You know, um, I don't have to worry about that where I'm at. Um, you know, my boss, um, we're, we're just about to open up another position. <laughs> we're still hiring for my team, you know, my boss gets it. And so, um, it's, you know, I'm not saying that all metrics are bad or that like, it's, it's not, you know, that the stuff can't be measured, but, but that's for the most part, really not my focus. You know, my focus is like, you know, the, the way that I measure my success is, is seeing the growth in the community of our projects and stuff, you know? The V cluster project has really taken off a lot in the last year. There's a lot of people who are excited about it. What one thing that we started to see like within the last few months, that's really exciting is we're seeing other people in the community making content about it now. So there's going to be a couple of talks at KubeCon that involve V cluster and, and, um, 
And so to me, that's, we sort of hit a new level there, right? Where like now the community is engaged enough that they're, they're actually talking about this thing too. It's not just us, you know, it's not just me writing stuff and doing talks. And so those are kind of more the sort of milestones and stuff that, that I look at as opposed to like, you know, how many page views did my blog post get or like how many YouTube views did I get or something like that. And I, I asked the question twofold because you wake up every day or you think on the weekend, like, what am I going to do this week? Like, I, I put a plan together. Like, what do I think is the most or the most important use of my time this week? But it has to be towards that goal. For me, it's a mar this role that you're in, the role that I'm in is a marathon. Nothing happens overnight. But for me, what I want to see year in and year out is revenue growth, business growth. If if the revenue didn't, it can grow a dollar for all I care, but if the revenue didn't grow over the last 12 months, then honestly, I'm doing something wrong, right? I'm doing something wrong. Why, why didn't we grow clients that didn't, that didn't generate into another, another sort of dollar? So for me, it's, it's a marathon around revenue. Now, there are some companies that aren't ready to start collecting revenue. So you can't use that as growth, which now means, I think, some of the things you mentioned, like, are, are more people following us? Am I getting people to show up when I'm offering a talk? Are they showing up? Maybe I'm doing a workshop. Um, those sorts of metrics. That are other people other than me producing content? That's cool because that's growth, right? There's growth in, in all of that. And so I think if you, revenue for me is number one. And I mean, it is, it is revenue for us too, where I'm at, you know, like, like, um, we are seeing more customers come on board and part of that is because of our work on the open source projects. Right. So it's like, you know, people, people all the time in with, with open source, um, projects, it's like, you could, you could build our product yourself, right? Like you could take the open source pieces that we've offered and put in the engineering time and, and build our product. But like, why would you do that when you could just pay us anyway, you know, and, and spend your engineering time working on your own product as opposed to like trying to duplicate ours, you know? So, so to me, that's, that's really, you know, the value of what our commercial product offers. And, and um, we love open source where I'm at, you know, we're super happy that like, the open source projects um, are getting so much attention and that they really help people like do their jobs better and be happier. But, but, you know, in the end, like that wouldn't be enough if it wasn't helping to drive the revenue too. So are you every Monday waking up and going, this is what I'm going to work on? Like, how do you decide? I met a lot of people in this role and they all kind of do it a little differently, but how do you decide what you're going to be working on today, tomorrow, next month? If that's, I don't think about it that far out usually, but what's your, what's your style? Um, for me, um, and I, I mean, I think that this is probably a little bit, um, to do with the ADHD. One of the reasons why I was really good at, at the improv comedy is because I'm a pretty spontaneous person. Right. And so I don't, I'm not somebody who tends to like plan a ton, um, a lot of the things that come up for us are, you know, some of them are like spur of the moment opportunities, like somebody reaches out to us and they want to do some content together or, you know, um, I just uh, got a talk accepted um, at a at a place that I'm pretty excited about. Um, there's this thing that happens right before KubeCon. It's called Cloud Native Rejects. Um, and it's people who submitted to KubeCon, but didn't get their talks accepted. <laughs> and so they give them a forum, like in the city that KubeCon's at, like right before the conference to do their talks. And so that talk literally, you know, they just released a schedule today. I'm on that. And so I'm going to be spending a bunch of time over the next few weeks, so like weeks, like working on that talk, but like, had it not gotten accepted, I'd have been doing something else completely, you know? So, so part of what, um, part of what I like is the spontaneity and, um, I think to me though, though, what I think a lot about is like what the value to the business is of the things that I'm doing. Right. And so when I'm making decisions, it's, to me, it's less about like planning out a big agenda, but more about like of the opportunities that are available right now, you know, which are the ones that are going to have the most impact for the company. I, I love that. My wife laughs at me because I don't like, 
But like the saying is dream in years, plan in months, live every day. And I hate putting plans on the calendar because I know that when that comes up, there's something better or something else I want to do. And now you're locked in and there's nothing. Yeah. I argue with people about, uh, I argue with people about OKRs sometimes, you know, um, and, and I haven't had a ton of experience with them and it's possible that I, my experience just that the people weren't doing it right, you know, but like when, when I was at a company that was doing OKRs, we were, you know, we were sort of in essence kind of planning out our quarter, you know, and, and I don't want to do that. Right. Because like, again, you know, it's, it's, there's so many spontaneous opportunities that can come up and things. And, and like, if you load your whole plate up for the quarter, like maybe something better comes along. Right. And, and you can of course always adjust OKRs and you can, you know, adjust what you want to do. But, but I feel like, especially, you know, we're still a very early startup, you know, we're like 20 people, something like that. And, and, and I feel like, um, that, that, being able to pivot, you know, and, and take another opportunity that's better that comes up, that those kinds of things are super important. And so, um, from that perspective, I don't, I don't like to get locked into too, into, into plans too much. And I think that, that that's part of why I work at these early companies, right. As opposed, like you couldn't think that way necessarily if you were working at IBM or something, you know, what is RKO? I don't think I've ever heard of that before. Uh, OKRs. Um, oh, oh, so yeah. oh and... what is it? O O K R. Okay. R. Yeah. It's, I think it started at Google and a lot of people use it, but it's, it's basically a way to like align people, you know, on, on what the goals are. Well, Rich, unfortunately, no, 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 finish, finish, finish your thought. Oh, I was just going to say, I was just going to say it's something that, that I think probably can be pretty valuable in terms of like goal setting and stuff, but but it also can can kind of be weaponized or, or done really badly too. Well, that's just about anything, I think, <laughs> right? Like you, you got to have, uh, I'm, I'm about as little process as possible, but some process. Yeah, same. Well, Rich, unfortunately, we are out of time. And I know I can keep talking to you for another hour. It's just, man, this went by way too fast. But this was fantastic for me. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> You try to go over my life story and you, you need like a five hour podcast for that. Well, I think we did pretty good kind of covering it. I mean, I, I love, love you started really kind of in theater and, and improv and uh, developing all those communication skills. And now we come kind of full circle and you found a role that lets you be both technical um, and, and leverage all those communication skills and, and be able to interact with people, which it sounds like you love. I think things happen for a reason. Yeah. And and even though you say I have some regret here or there, um, it got you where you are today. So you don't want to go back and change it because I think you're really happy with where you are right now. Yeah. I mean, who knows what would happen if I would have taken that, that sysadmin job. You know? Yeah. Can't, we can't second guess. So, so I think you made all the right choices, at least up till now. <laughs> Thanks. I, I have to say that I'm um, I'm really excited that we got a chance to talk. I've uh, been um, you know aware of you for quite some time. I always hear really glowing things about about your teaching, and um, I feel like you're someone who's contributed a lot to like the Go community. So um, it's really great to to get to meet you on camera. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's really great to to finally talk with you. So this is it. Oh, so Rich, if anybody wants to reach out to you after listening to the show, what's the best way for them to, to reach out? Um, if you're on Twitter, that's the best way. Um, I'm, I'm at Rich Burroughs there. Um, I, uh, um, my DMs are open. I sometimes forget to look at them, but, um, but you know, feel free to at me or, or DM me if it's something more private. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn though. Um, uh, so if you search for Rich Burroughs there, you should find me too. We'll get all that in the show notes. All right, Rich. Thank you for all your time. I really appreciate This is Bill Kennedy and Rich with the OnLabs podcast signing off and hope to see everybody again real soon.